Hi, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of the Sonic Talk Podcast. With me today is Jason Berry and the guy who was supposed to be with us last week, but many, many things went wrong, um, Tracy uh, Yarley. How are you doing, Hello. Tracy? I'm and fine. It's Tracy with an exclamation point, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have to shout his name every time you say it. <laughs> Hopefully uh, well, I won't end up three seconds ahead of everybody this time. Yes, yes. We had a we interviewed Yardley, uh, Mr. Mr. Yardley, two weeks ago, and uh, the the audio messed up, and so our voice, and so Jason's voice was r- running over us. So uh, hopefully that will not happen this time. So <laughs> we're going to do we're going to do a little test in a moment, but um, first let's uh, we're, we're going to be talking about a few things. Sonic coming to the Ooh, yeah, the Lost Worlds trailer and the 3DS game and the third Sonic title. <coughs> Let's start with the Ooh, yeah, because I get the feeling this is probably some of the more, uh, this is going to be something that uh, no one here particularly cares about because I don't think anyone is getting an Ooh, yeah, at least none of us. Not mm. that I know of. I'm not really that interested in that. Tracy, nah. do, you know what the, do you know what the Ooh, yeah is? I have seen it. Yeah, I've, I've heard of it. Uh, yeah, I don't really have any interest in it particularly. Yeah, for for, for those of you who don't know, it's a uh, it's it's pretty much just a an a, an Android in a box. It's a open source ninety nine dollar game system running off of a Tegra three processor capable of running Android games, and I can play all these games on my cell phone. In fact, I can. In fact, I actually bought this neat. You, you know what? I I jumped ahead. We usually talk about what games we've been playing, so I guess I might as well start off. <laughs> yeah. I I uh, recently got this thing called the Moga uh, Bluetooth controller. It is this um, game pad that has this thing that latches onto a cell phone, and it literally lets you play cell phone games such as Sonic the Hedgehog and Sonic CD and Sonic Four with actual buttons, and it is glorious. <laughs> it, it is not the most portable thing because it, it, it it's essentially just this Xbox 360 controller that you have to carry around with you. But um, yeah, it is pretty cool. convenient. Well, it, it's convenient enough, especially if you want to play the new and improved Sonic One, which is which is what I wanted to do with awesome controls, and as what I've gotten to do now, and it's awesome. Now I can play Grand Theft Auto Three and Barg's Tale and. All those Android games I've been ignoring because touchscreen con- controls suck on a proper on a proper game controller. Hmm, that does sound cool. <laughs> uh, uh, Jason, what have you been playing? Well, on your recommendation, because you're saying how much it m- more it was easier on the Game Gear, I picked up uh, Sonic 2 for the Master System <laughs> off of eBay for about twelve bucks. <laughs> and for a while, I didn't know about the um, about the uh, level select code so I'd get up to about the second boss in the game and just keep dying all over again because there's no continues unless you end the stage with exactly 77 rings <laughs> and there's no checkpoints or anything but the stages themselves are kind of short compared to the Sonic 1 it's yeah. okay but I don't think it's as good as Sonic 1 on the master system the levels are way too short and the bosses are just so uh, so, so. They, were, they are quite a bit tougher than Genesis because they they have Sonic with no rings on those stages at all. The bosses in the Game Gear, ver- the, the the first boss in the Game Gear version is brutal. <laughs> hmm. I played those years and years ago. I can't recall. <laughs> uh, have you have you had time to play any games recently? Uh, not a whole lot of time. I I take some time that I probably shouldn't. I have a I have a PS Vita. I've been playing Guacamelee. Ooh, that's, and, uh, that's a good one. And um, Need for Speed Most Wanted is a lot of fun. So, <laughs> awesome. I actually I actually do have a, a DSi also. Like just the other day, for, for the heck of it, I, I started playing Sonic Chronicles: The Dark Brotherhood. Eh, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I'm mixed <laughs> yeah. about it. That's, that's just, kind of the general impression I hear from people. Eh, I don't know. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's, not, it's, it's not. It's not bad. It's just you know. It's not. It's not great. <laughs> yeah, it could use a little more polish or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, the soundtrack is absolutely horrid. 
I've heard rumors regarding the soundtrack. I don't know how true they are, you know, where they had to scrap yeah. the whole thing and pull things off of the uh, off of the internet. Like, I don't know uh, if that's something that they, that they could actually do. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it does sound kind of not great. Yeah, it's just kind of generic. So, not doesn't sound very Sonic at I mean, all. Pull stuff off the internet. I would think they could pull the great stuff off the internet, like that what? stuff from uh, damn it, um, from over, from Overclock Remix. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, who knows? But uh, yeah, that's the, those are the only games I've played recently. So, does uh, when I need to be working in. <laughs> so uh, I, I kind of, we kind of in- interrupted the whole Ouya thing with with that because I jumped ahead. Been a while since I properly hosted. Um, anyone want anyone want to talk any more about the Ouya or? Not really. Um, I mean, if I get it, maybe it's be for like emulation or something like that, but. Hey. Otherwise, I wouldn't touch it. Yeah, I mean, I like the, the fact that it's a... tag is, is is tempting to me, but the fact that you can only really play cell phone games and ports of games I already have on other consoles, it just I don't, I don't, I don't really get the appeal. Yeah, I like but the fact that it was a Kickstarter project and it actually got off the ground. That's kind of yeah. cool. But, that, that is know. cool that there was that we actually had a Kickstarter console. <laughs> And certainly, at least a better idea than the, than, than the Nvidia Shield, which I I was looking at, I was thinking about because I really want really wanted to play uh, those Sonic games with the control with controls, but then I found out it was three hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> Man, yeah, it's a lot of money to play Sonic. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of money to play uh, glorified glorified console ports and cell phone games. So, uh, the Sonic Lost Worlds trailer. That was interesting. Uh, yeah. Lots of people trying to compare it to either to Sonic Extreme and Mario Galaxy, but I think Mario Galaxy is a bit of a stretch, because, I don't know, I mean, Sonic yeah. Extreme was doing a lot of this stuff before Mario Galaxy was around, so... Yeah, I would Mar- that... This one seems to have the artificial gravity type thing that Mario has, the Mario mm. Galaxy has. Maybe. Yeah, I did see the uh, the trailer on IGN, and uh, before I even read the article, uh, yeah, the compa- you know the visual comparison to Mario Galaxy jumped out at me pretty quickly. So, huh. <laughs> which is fine. I think Mario Galaxy is a fantastic game. Oh yeah. I, to have a Sonic version of it is fine with me. Mario Galaxy is a beautiful <laughs> game, and it's also really probably one of my favorite 3D platformers, aside from. Maybe Sonic Generations because I'm a Sonic fanboy. So, <laughs> but um, I I I I really like this new simplistic style that they're going for. It's very cartoony. Well, I felt like yeah. uh, Sonic Colors had a quite a bit of a Mario Three feel to it with those uh, open world like well not open world but the the maps for every single level and there was a lot of 2D platforming sections that reminded me of Mario. Like there's some kind of there's kind of a version of the Thwomps in that game too. Um, oh, just things yeah. smashing down on you. So that, it, had, uh, it had a kind of a Mario feel to it. That uh, that uh, ga- damn it, that Galactic ga- Galaxy Carnival thing. Yeah. yeah. Um. Uh. But uh, Tr- Tracy, what 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 do you think of the uh, of the of the new sort of simplistic style of the game? I think it's really cool. Uh, particularly if you're going to have it on a handheld, I think that would be helpful you yeah, know, to yes. simplify the graphics, you know? I don't know if we've actually seen any screenshots from the 3DS version. Oh, we actually but, have. Uh, um, have they? Has, yeah. Hmm. It hasn't been given as much attention, but we have been give, given th- screenshots of the 3DS version, which, which we'll be talking about in a moment. But um, I, I just hope that they use this new, that, that, that they use this, the, the more simplistic graphics to produce a smoother game. Because as awesome as Sonic Generations was, it, the the frame rate the frame rate could still be pretty crappy, and I, and I think that's because of all the stuff that they that they have going on in, in any given level. The, the, the generations levels are very busy. Yeah, that's true. Um, I don't know how I feel about the design of the villains and that. They seem like so radically different from <laughs> yeah. Sonic and everybody else. I don't know. I mean. Doesn't that doesn't look look any worse than the Werehog did? I don't no, know. the I Werehog just... fit kind of better, I think. Hmm. 
I'm I'm probably one of the few people that don't really have any real problem with the Werehog. I know that he's kind of silly, and I get people's uh, gripe with his gameplay, but I still don't I don't mind him at all. Well, yeah, because we, <laughs> people playing. I mean, a, a, a Werehog with stretchy arms. How how does that make any sense? Yeah, and, it, it, it doesn't make sense. Thing with a with a with a speedy blue hedge- hedgehog. How does that make any sense? It's not as if hedgehogs are naturally fast creatures. They are, in fact, quite slow. <laughs> yeah, people just complain about uh, car- stuff in a cartoon hedgehog world. is kind of <laughs> silly. So, um, well, 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 if we're done there, I guess we'll move on to uh, Sonic Lost World's 3DS, which is now going, which is going to be the first handheld Sonic game. In full 3D, at least that I know of. I mean, I don't believe there's any. Guy- yeah, every other one's been like a Dimps port that has a Sonic Rush feel to it. Or Sonic. Even, when, Rock- even Generations with its 3D graphics was done uh, with all 2D. It was still a side scroller. Yeah. Yeah, still, still side scroller. But um, it, it looks pretty nice and polished for a 3DS game. I mean, compared to a lot of 3DS games, including Generation, which Generations, which typically looks very, which typically look look very pixelated and um, and uh, well, pixelated. I guess is all I have to say. This this game this game looks very smooth. Well, I think the simplistic style helps with that. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, it's, it's going to be really nice. Oh, what were you saying? I was just saying, I was looking at the pictures online right now. So, <laughs> yeah, it looks like yeah, I think it looks like a really fun game, personally. Yeah, I, I do. I do really enjoy that they're going back to a to a slower platforming kind of Sonic game. That is something that I've been wanting them to do. I think I've even advocated on a uh, on um, Sonic uh, on Sonic Talk before, where I want them to go back to something closer to the adventures style because. I I I think when you make it when you when you're making a game this this fast, it, it, it's going to be it's gonna, it's going to be a very short game. It's going to be a, a game where you, where you complete every any given level in a couple minutes, and it's just it doesn't really let you sit down and savor it like a Mario game does, and the Sonic Adventure games for that matter. I think uh, that the Sonic just works better with a more Saturday morning cartoon style anyway, because. Every, and whenever they took the series like on a darker road, you know, two series like Sonic Adventure <laughs> One, Two, it, it didn't work out so well. That, especially like Shadow the Hedgehog or Sonic. You mean that damn fourth Chaos Emerald? Yeah, or uh, Sonic O Six, which is just absolutely horrible. And then they went with uh, very much an Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog style with um, colors. <laughs> and then really, uh, the generation stories is incredibly simplistic. And then here it's, it looks even more like a <coughs> cartoon. Yeah, I think I think it's a good direction for things, more lighthearted. Yeah, and I, I you know I agree with the uh, having slower platforming is is fine because really when you go back to the first Sonic game, it's actually in my opinion pretty slow. Yeah, it <laughs> That's is. Particularly the the Marble Garden or whatever is it the Mar- the second zone Marble Garden yeah. is that? I, I, that's, I, that's so I, slow. You, you know, there's so many jumps that you have to time just perfectly. Takes you like an hour to get through that level. <laughs> yeah, That's true. The, the old Sonic games were, were could be quite slow because uh, if you went if you went too fast, you just hit spikes and enemies and you die. So, yeah, I mean, you, you really only go fast with lots of practice, and I think that's really how it should be in a in a, in a, in a, in a really good Sonic game. So ho- yeah. hopefully the the, lo- the level design allows for that. Well. In the world. You and me will know in uh, just a few days when we finally get our hands on the game at E3. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it was just called the Marble Zone. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. My God, that level looks complicated. <laughs> that was a weird laugh. <laughs> yeah, that's my girlish squeal. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. funny when you, you think about the the, you know, the backgrounds on these games. Uh, yeah, like when I had to draw the... It's backgrounds for uh, Sonic 2 and the Genesis uh-huh. story. They're a lot, yeah, they're a lot more complicated than you realize <laughs> when, if you actually start to draw them out. Yeah, because those worlds are just so funky looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
that, that, that's that's uh, something I, I I've kind of been missing from some of the more recent Sonic games. I guess they have been they they haven't been, been able to quite bring back the surreal look of the uh, for, of the first few games. That's true. All right, uh, I think that wraps it up for our. Oh, there's break. one more, uh, the third Sonic game. Now, between our two Sonic talks, we uh, this story changed twice. First, it was Nintendo of Germany revealing that the third Sonic game was coming this year. And then before we could have our next Sonic talk, it was revealed by Sega that no, in fact, it is coming next year. And so this leaves the door wide open for it potentially being a, for lack of a better term, third main Sonic title. <laughs> Either that or another one of those storybook type games. Yeah, but I, 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 I kind of think that I kind of think that Lost World may be the storybook type title, much like Colors was. Maybe. Um, mm. There was rumors that it was going to be like Sonic and Mario Kart or something for a while. Yeah. I, I think that stemmed from a uh, from from a comment from Soul. I know it, went, it went around the internet for quite a bit. Mm. All right. Um, I, 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 I guess that's it. Unless you have anything to add, Tracy? Um, no, not really. Not a lot okay. of score. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to take a little break with the musical interlude, and we'll be right back. And we're back. I hope you enjoy whatever music Jason just picked. And uh, yeah, we're, we're still here with Mr. Tracy Yarley, the artist, one, one of the one of the primary artists for the uh, Sonic Archie comics. Hello. And we're here to ask him some questions. <laughs> so, um, all right. Now, the, all these questions do come from Bumble King. So, uh, this first one is from Nitroactive. Uh, okay. What age did you start drawing and writing stories? What age? Yeah, what age? Uh, yeah, well, I like uh, I've always drawn forever, you know, since I can remember. <laughs> I really, uh, I used to, when I was little, I used to draw, you know, Pac-Man and uh, Mickey Mouse and and stuff like that. So I, I really enjoyed Pac-Man and the ghost monster <laughs> things. <laughs> My brother had an Atari, and I'd sit up at night and watch him play it. So, um, you know, as far as writing stories go, I really haven't done a lot of writing. I did those three issues of Sonic X several years ago, and now uh, I'm currently writing a four-issue story arc for Sonic Universe, and I wrote one about two years ago. So that'll put my total of actual professional scripts at uh, about, what, eight? 11. So, you know, I, I wrote some, uh, you know, kind of comedy slash noir detective stories when I was in high school, I, and I'm sure they were completely terrible. <laughs> but uh, it was still fun, so, you know. Yeah, that, that's what it's all about, really. Fun. So, um, did you want to work for Archie Comics, or, or what, was there any other company that you were aspiring to work for when you were younger? 
Um, I never really specifically wanted to work for any particular company. I um, I've read the I, you know, I I saw the initial Archie miniseries for Sonic back in '93 or whatever it was, and I really really enjoyed it. And I thought, wow, that'd be a lot of fun to do that. Since I was a big Sonic fan at the time, and still am, and um, I went to when I went to art school, I kind of really was at the time wanting to do syndicated cartoon strips, you know, in the newspaper. But that's an extremely difficult thing to get into. It's really difficult to do. Uh, you know, as hard as it is to get into the comics business, it's way harder even to get into syndicated comic strips. Uh, There's so uh, few spaces us, for it. Hmm? Oh, yeah, because uh, I was about to ask you, and I think you just answered. Uh, could you tell us why it's more difdifficult? Yeah, largely because you know, there's like three or maybe four or so major syndicates in the nation. And, you know, the way it goes is you send your stuff to them. If they like it, you know, they'll buy the rights off you to distribute it to the various newspapers around the country. But, you know, I mean, there's only so many newspapers and there's only so many space. There's so much space in those papers for new comic strips. So, you know, you got, you know, dinosaurs like peanuts and beetle Bailey and stuff that will never go away. Uh, so there's very limited room. You know, most of these syndicates will maybe pick up one or two news strips a year. And, you know, aside from, you know, the you know, almost impossible uh, odds of getting, you know, picked to do it. It's just a difficult thing to do to come up a, a even rem, remotely humorous gag every day is, is just really really hard. So oh yeah, you, you've got to have like a you, you've got to have a special skill for that. Yeah, you know you got to have a you know, quite a inexhaustible sense of humor, which I just don't. So <laughs> so uh, this next question is from the, these next uh, let's see uh, these next. Eight questions are from Palm Tree Panic. Dang. Oh, wow. Eight. <laughs> uh, uh, how, how did you get the opportunity to start writing for the comic? Um, I started writing for the comic back when Sonic X was being published. Um, it started off with Joe Edkin as the main writer, but he, I guess, for whatever reason, you know, ran out of steam or didn't want to do it anymore. And Ian started writing some scripts, but there was also space for new writers to step in and try their hand. So I asked the uh, uh, then editor, Mike Pellerito, if I could give it a shot. So he let me in. <laughs> I, what was that? The first one I wrote was issue 24, the uh, the, you know, the camera hog ep- episode where they were on TV. And I thought it turned out okay. You know, I, I, I liked a lot of it, but uh, the ending wasn't exactly spectacular. And and then, you know, later on, I, I had another idea for another story, which ended up being the Green-Eyed Monster two-parter with the Chaos Bot and all that stuff. But that, um, I had mentioned it before, that the uh, it started out as a much, much different story to begin with. I had a sort of a green energy theme going on. That was the only component of that story that carried over to the Green-Eyed Monster thing. Um, initially, the story was going to be uh chris's dad you know had some stake in this uh, environmental uh environmentally friendly you know farming business you know industrial farming and sonic and his friends were gonna go there and visit the facility and get a tour or whatever and of course eggman would show up and you know turn the robots into death machines and i was gonna have cream somehow be a focus of the story that was kind of my intent she was not a very uh, uh, didn't have much screen time, so to speak. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, that all just got changed completely. Mike had some other ideas, and, and it all just morphed into a completely different thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> but then you know, yeah, years went by, and Ian was the main writer for Sonic the Hedgehog and Sonic Universe, and I certainly didn't want to step on his toes. But Sonic Universe allowed for a little more leeway you know there's not as much continuity to have to deal with there sure. you can you can tell standalone stories with sonic universe so uh that's when i i started with the babylon rogues idea of course and in the end it morphed and and ended up incorporating main <laughs> continuity too plus my <laughs> intent 
<laughs> but I think it worked out pretty well. I think one of, one of the few Sonic Universe stories to really tie directly into the into what was going on in the main comic. Yeah, <laughs> so you're right. Yeah, and that's like in a true yeah. true crossover. Um, so, uh, what what made you uh, what 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 made you decide to um, to pr- propose to uh, Mike Pellerito that 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 you that you'd like to write something? I just thought it would be fun, you know. I, um, it's particularly with Sonic X. It, that was a difficult book because we could not do anything um, that would alter the, the canon of the television show. So the characters could never really grow or develop in any significant way. Um, but given that constraint, you know, I, I still thought there maybe it was more that could be done with it. I, I thought Ian's scripts were fine. I thought Joe Edkin's scripts were fine, but uh, you know, I just wanted to try my hand and see what I could do with it, basically. Awesome. Well, um, well, well, well I'm glad you got that opportunity. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> okay, the second. Okay, uh, Palm Tree Panic's next question: uh, What is the process for designing a cover? How do you and the rest of the Archie team decide what you put into your covers? Uh, there's two basic different ways that that happens. Either you know. First off, uh, Ian does his breakdowns for the script, and we try to do the covers way ahead of time because they need to be ready for the solicitations. So, you know, they they usually get done a a month or two before the interior artwork is done. Mm -hmm. So by that time, Ian doesn't always have a a complete script written out. He'll just have the outline. So I take a look at that and decide what's, you know, what's the most important aspects of the story. Uh, you know, and I think about what would be a you know a gripping you know, image, <laughs> something that would really catch your attention. Based on that, sometimes I'll I'll come up with something and it, it'll click right away. Sometimes it'll be difficult to think of that. A lot of times, also, uh, Paul Kaminsky has you know very specific ideas of what he wants to see, and probably the majority of the covers that you you see in the end are are largely his ideas. Huh. So, uh, uh, you know, generally I'll do, uh, you know, three, four, five, or six or so thumbnail ideas, real quick sketches of what, you know, some ideas that I have, however many I can come up with, shoot them over Paul, to Paul, he'll take a look, and he'll, and he'll um, let me know what he thinks about them, ask for, diff- you know, changes or whatever, and then I'll, once we nail down one we like, I'll do a, a rough pencil sketch of it to really hammer out the details. And once that is figure, figured out, then I'll go to the final drawing. Hmm. Interesting. Mm. So, so as, oh. as to how we pick, as to how we pick, yeah, what is in there, it just depends, you know. Yeah, we just take whatever's happening in the story and try to think of something, uh, you know, very uh, eye-catching, iconic. And it doesn't always have to be something exactly that's happening in the story, you know. Like Depends the Iron Queen holding a Sonic and Sally and the surrounded in green stuff. <laughs> yes, exactly. That doesn't specifically happen in the story, but it's something that, you know, yeah, they, they are in the digital world and they are being attacked by her, so. But, yeah. So, um, uh, in Ian's scripts, does he mostly write out what's in a panel, or do you have a lot of freedom to uh, improvise? Generally speaking, he's, it's pretty specific. You know, his scripts, I'm assuming, are like most any other comic script. You have your page one, panel one, then you have your scene description, and you have text for each of the characters or text boxes or whatever. Then panel two, and the same thing over and over. Um Depending on what he wants, sometimes he'll be very specific. You know, if he wants a certain camera angle or a certain, uh, you know, wide shot, close up, whatever. Some, sometimes he'll indicate that. Sometimes he won't. Depends on what specifically he wants. So uh, I try, in general, to try to keep to that script as much as I can. Occasionally, I, I'll think that some, you know, different angle. Might work better, uh, more of a close up or a zoom out or whatever. 
Um, sometimes I will think of a different uh, arrangement for the characters or perhaps a slightly different facial expression that might, I, in my opinion, suit the situation better. I, generally, I try to stick to what he's written, but, you know, it's a fluid sort of thing, so sometimes I make some little tweaks, and he never seems to complain about it, so... <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you're you're the art you're the artist, so you, I I find that artists, you know, tend to art artists are the people to trust when it comes to you know, vi, um, tr- someone's vi, uh, I don't, I someone's don't vision. To, yeah, I, yeah, I get you. I understand. <laughs> yeah, I understand what you mean. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And it's tough, you know, it's tough to write things down, yeah, because they don't always come out. It won't, won't always be so easy to translate into a visual. Yeah. Even with the scripts I've written, you know, I, there's a few panels like, why did I put all that in there? There's no way. <laughs> so sometimes you got to pare it down. That's usually the most often the cases. There'd be just way too much to describe visually. Yeah. Uh, in one of these Ian, small panels. Ian, Ian, Ian would often talks about how he 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 tried to do way too much during his uh um just just uh during his uh. Darkest Storm three parter. <laughs> yeah, I didn't uh, have to draw that one, but uh, yeah, that was all Fry. <laughs> I think, I think, you, got, I think you left out there a little, Tracy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was the main back when uh, Joe Edkin did Sonic X. Um, yeah, that was he packed way, way, way too much on some of those pages. There was even a, a couple times where I literally had no choice but to uh, rewrite a couple, you know, a page or two. And say this has to change because there's not it's not humanly possible to fit all that in there. So, <laughs> so um, uh, are are there any characters that you, that you don't like to draw? Like I don't know, Ixus Nagus or uh, or uh, well, like, actually, yeah, Ix, oh, him in particular. I think Ixus Nagus. Had, hmm? I was gonna say I think Doctor Finictivus or whatever his name is would be Finitivus. pretty tough. Yeah, oh. he's got a. Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, let me start by saying that all the Sonic characters are deceptively simplistic looking, you know. They are pretty simple, but a lot of them also have a lot of detail, more than you kind of realize. Uh, you know, like Dr. Eggman and those guys, you know, particularly all the goggles and the glasses and all the buttons and zippers and things on his suit, uh, you know. But yeah, doc- yeah, characters like Dr. Finitivus, they're kind of, yeah, they got a lot of doodads and glasses and emblems on their cape and stuff and um julie sue has all that junk on her hair and on her arms <laughs> and everywhere and, um but yeah nixus and august was kind of probably one of the most difficult i hadn't really thought about it before uh but until ben bates showed up ben redesigned him you know in a way that he fit perfectly with the, the sega design in it so I was like, well, that's the way I'm going to draw him from now on. So yeah, it's just his, his mouth in particular. Like from the old Saturday morning cartoon, he had that kind of Simpsons mouth sort of thing going on. Where the top lip went way far over, and it just didn't make sense, you know, three-dimensionally. So you can only draw him, you know, like from a side angle. <laughs> just, yeah, it took me a long time to figure that. I never actually, never actually never did figure it out until Ben Bates... Uh, came up with that new design it's like yeah that's perfect hmm. so um are there, are there any locations to, or stages from the games that you want to draw in the comic mm. now well like i said none, none in particular i've already drawn um the chemical plant zone which is probably my favorite stage of all i drew that in the genesis story other than that, no, there's nothing specific. I, you know, I kind of like that the lava reef and, and uh, like Sonic and Knuckles, you know, where the death egg is crashed into the <laughs> mountain and all that stuff. That was yeah. pretty cool. That, that is a really impressive looking looking level. Um, uh, so what is Archie's process for designing a new character? Um, it, it varies. Like I said, there's some characters uh, that are... I have entire full reign to, to design. That doesn't happen very often, like particularly the um, issue 24 of Sonic X that I wrote. You know, I wrote that robot that has the attributes of all the main characters, which, you know, I, it took me a little while. I, initially, I was going to have a line of dialogue, 
explaining that he was based off of that emerald robot, the gizoid or whatever. Yeah. And so I was in my initial first few designs kind of had that sort of look to him. But when I when he thought about it, it just didn't make you know why even drag that continuity in there. Um, and then we thought you know I just try to do it in a different way. And I thought that well, there's no character that is all white in the Sonic X show, and you know white is theoretically the combination of all colors or whatever. So I went with that. I thought the you know I had kind of tried to give him you know some uh, some cues from like uh, what is it the Evangelion you know those white robots in the uh, ah. the, the the movie you know. Yeah, those really thick black lines. I don't remember the white uh, rope, but then again, then again, I've not seen much Evangelion. Yeah, yeah uh, they were in the last movie. They were, you know, oh. just like a bunch of them. They fly, and anyway, but uh, they were all white, and they had a lot of little black accent lines, and I thought that was a really cool. So that's what I, that's kind of where I stole for that. Hmm. But in general, yeah, in general, when you're coming up with a character, you just start pulling ideas out of your head or from things you remember, and try to. Rework them, modify them, change them, you know, combine them in different ways and see what sticks and what looks cool. Sometimes whenever I'm draw- doing a character, Ian will already have some ideas that he'll have sketched out for me, you know, and I'll, I'll work from there to flesh it out or whatever. So there aren't too many brand new characters showing up all the time. Uh, I think, what was it? Uh, uh, Thrash. The Tasmanian Devil. That was yeah. kind of where that was one where Ian had you know some specific ideas. He wanted to be purple. Wanted him to have kind of a sonic fin on his head and the knuckles dreads kind of combined and the the Lego pieces on his boots and gloves and stuff. <laughs> that's what I call him anyway. Yeah. So <laughs> that's what I, yeah. I heard. He was based off uh, when you're changing, selecting either Sonic or Knuckles and Sonic and Knuckles. It, <laughs> he's like in the halfway point. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, well, I like it. Yeah, that kind of makes sense, I guess. He's a little bit of a mix of the two. So, yeah, there's just there's no rhyme or reason to it specifically. It depends on the situation. So, are there are there any characters that you've designed for the main Sonic book? I mean, well, I I suppose there are, but can you can you name a few? If I any characters that I've outright designed for the main Sonic book, um, not really exactly. I, I did design the whole new Mobotropolis city, <laughs> and I put that specific cowboy hat onto Bunny. She used to have kind of a more of an Indiana Jones style hat, but mm. I, I thought she should have more of a cowboy hat with those. You see sometimes where the 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 brim curls up on the edges. That's what I did with that. I don't think I don't think that I designed anything. Any new characters for that book? No, I can't think of any anyway. Okay. So, um, if you could redesign any character from the Sonic comic, uh, who would it be and why? Uh, redesign. I don't know. Um, maybe Bunny. I like her look a lot, as it is, but, you know... It would be fun to play with her robotic limbs and do different things with them. Hmm. Uh, I'm trying to think of any... Oh, Rotor. I don't really... Rotor doesn't... He just always gives me kind of some trouble with like his legs and things. He just doesn't quite fit stylistically with the other characters. Yeah, really he, at all. I mean, yeah, because the other characters are usually t- quite lanky. And he's like... He's very bulky and doesn't really have much in the way of legs. Yeah, well, yeah, his legs, his legs are specifically the problem. They're more, slightly, I guess, more "quote unquote" realistic in the way that they're designed, but it just doesn't make sense to to draw them that way. You know. And one of the things that always bugged me with him was um, when he broke his back, he had this just this old man look to him when he was on the council. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, recently, uh, I think it was like around issue two thirty-five or. So somewhere around there, we kind of tried to do a, re- a slight redesign because he started using his nanite suit all the time, you know, where he'd have the gloves and boots on, and he could just press the button on his bandolier thing and shoot oh, on his suit would jump onto him, you know. Yeah. 
So and we tried to make him look a little bit younger, back to his, you know, his yellow hat and stuff, you no know, glasses. So, yeah, he does look quite a bit better now. So, um, what are your top three uh, Sonic covers that you that you've drawn? Mm. That's a tough. That's a tough choice. I was definitely in the top three because of nostalgia and the you know the the cool factor is that cut, cover from issue one sixty nine where Sonic goes super, you know, with Super Sonic Turbo Tails and Super Shadow. That was a lot of fun. I, it was the second, only the second cover that I'd ever drawn, and it was you know a real you know splashy big supersonic his fist coming at you. They recently reused it for the uh, uh, saga series. Yeah, the, for the saga series also they they reprinted on that one. They flipped huh. it, a bit of mirror image flip of it, and it doesn't quite look right to me because I <laughs> do have a, a very slight skew to my drawing. You know, it's not exactly symmetrical the way it should be. You know, if you flip things around, they, they sometimes they look a little skewed. But uh, I never, I never noticed that. I gotta look yeah. at that. Yeah, take some of my stuff and you know, flip it in Photoshop. You'll notice it doesn't always look quite right when it's flipped. Hmm. There's, a, there's an actual term for that. It's a, uh, I, I can't remember what it is. Like whenever you kind of skew your drawings a little bit one way or the other, it's probably because of the way I have to. You know, squint over my drawings with my bad eyesight. So, <laughs> anyway, back to the covers. Uh, I trying to think of any other that I like. Um, the one that you mentioned earlier with uh, Iron Queen holding Sonic and Sally. That's I like that cover a lot, just because it's different and kind of unusual. Uh, hmm. Maybe the one with Big the Cat running. Holding Sonic and Sally. That was, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah, there's, there, I've done quite a number of covers, so it's, it's tough to to pick ones out. Also, the last cover in the uh, the Tales story arc in Sonic Universe with the big, you know, legion of the big fire well, with all the firing stuff looks really epic, right? Uh, which one? Oh, that was the third one in that series. Oh. I I don't I know. Actually, that was the second one. I, I'm referring to the one. It's kind of a movie poster sort of montage where you got the legion of battle birds at the bottom and then the, oh, the villains yeah. and tails and Speedy swooping by in the middle. So, yeah, that's yeah. one of my favorites for sure. It does, oh, give a, does give a very epic – does have a very epic feel to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that'd be – there's, post, there's some, some covers like that that would, I think would make you know cool posters if you could get the artwork and take the logos off and whatnot. Hmm. Well, well, actually, he's doing poster books now, so yeah. maybe. Yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> um, all right, Jason, was there anything that, that you wanted to say? Uh, um, no, that's, that's fine. Oh, okay. All right, these next two are from Anime Cowboy. Um. You are you, you definitely have okay. Now you you definitely have an exceptionally good handle on dynamic action scenes and camera angles. What are some of your influences, and do you have any tips for portraying these scenes for other artists? Hmm. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, I do generally try to mix up my camera angles a lot. Mostly because it's really kind of boring to draw the same shot over and over. So, yeah. and you know, it's tedious and it's difficult to. There are certain situations in a sequential page of comics where you want what is called a moment-to-moment progression. You know, say like somebody is reading a book, somebody's sneaking up behind them to whack them on the head, <laughs> and they preempt them and say, "I know you're there," or whatever, something like that. <laughs> that sort of situation would be great to have the same exact shot three times in a row, which is, you know, that's cool sometimes, but it's also not a lot of fun to draw. So, um, yes, partic- you know, particularly with Sonic and stuff, it's very dynamic, a lot of action going on all the time. So, uh, yeah, you know, having the camera angle way down low or way up high, or it just changes things up and makes it more fun to draw the characters from different angles. As far as tips on how to do that, um, I don't know, just... You know, before you start drawing, think hard about well, how, where could I position my so you know, quote unquote, camera, and how to make this look cooler. 
Just don't <laughs> just don't just get stuck in drawing everything from the same front flat view, same distance. Yeah. If you look at look at old comic strips like Blondie, you know, every single shot is like a full body shot. That's gotta be really tedious to draw. So, you know. <laughs> it, it's um, not also not yeah, not very dynamic. So just change change things up. Think hard about different viewpoints. Yeah, because um, really, comic books are all about that. Are, are, are all about the visual medium. So if if you if you can't make it look interesting, it's going to be more difficult to hold the reader's attention, even if your script's really good. Yeah, depending on what you're doing, of course. You know, there's some stories where if you're telling an emotional tale, you know, perhaps like a real life slice of life story about someone mourning the death of a family member, you're not going to have a bunch of crazy. You know, dynamic action shots. <laughs> oh yeah, like, <laughs> depends on what you're doing. But uh, Sonic the Hedgehog is all about fun and yeah, fun visuals, oh. stuff like that. So, um, so uh, any personal projects? Um, uh, projects you, uh, you are you are, you are going to be any projects that you'll be doing outside of Archie? Probably not anytime soon. I just really don't have the time. I barely barely keep up with my work as it is you know i have uh, five kids and i work at home and right now it's also summertime so it's it's pretty hard to get anything done mm -hmm. um there's lots of things i'd like to do of course i'd like to write my own stories i have a, you know a couple things on my mind that i think would make you know one that would make a really good novel which i'd kind of like to try to do at some point i'll probably never get around to it <laughs> um, one that would make, I think, a really a fun comic book too. You know, there's, uh, there's a story that I'd kind of like to do with Sabrina the Teenage Witch. I don't know if Archie would be interested in doing it or not. If they weren't, of course, I could just revamp it to not include her or whatever. You know, just, but who knows? I don't. You know, Sabrina is a staple for Archie, so yeah. Well, they haven't really used her since the. Uh, the manga series stopped running a few years ago. I mean, yeah. you know, there's there's other. I'd like to do other licensed books, perhaps. You know, I, I think we had mentioned this before uh, about the if I if I had a chance to do other licensed material, I'd, uh, Inspector Gadget is one of my favorite old cartoons. I'd like to kind of revamp him so he's not quite such a buffoon. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll uh, still be silly, though, right? Yeah, it, it'd be fun and funny. Yeah, but he, you know. Yeah, he wouldn't be quite such a such not a complete screw up at least. And uh, Darkwing Duck was always one of my most favorite cartoons when I was a kid. I know they had done some comics. Boom Studios, I think, had put them out a while back, but yeah. I don't know if I don't know if they still are. Uh, when Disney bought Marvel, they pretty much canceled all of their. They pretty much ended all their comic deals, and so mm -hmm. and so Kaboom yeah. lost their Disney stuff, which yeah, maybe it'll come back. You know, yeah. Or, you know, Hopefully, do. Or yeah, that's kind of sad. Yeah. Well, I I guess hope you get a chance to do that novel of yours. I mean, yeah, maybe someday. <laughs> I mean, you're writing for. I mean, not you're writing and drawing for one of the most popular video game comics out there. So that actually that should that should get you somewhere, right? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I'm, writing is is much different than drawing. You know, I mean. At least with writing with writing comics, for me, since I draw them as well, it's you know I, I have the visuals in my head either way, whether I'm writing it down or whether I'm drawing it. So there's there comes a point when I'm writing the story, I almost don't need to draw it. I don't feel the need to draw it because it's already in my head. I can see the story already, but uh, I know that no one else will if I don't if I don't draw it. Plus, I wouldn't get paid if I didn't draw it. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, writing is a lot different. It does. It, it takes a lot of effort and work in your mind. It's not nearly as physical, at least not for me, anyway. You know, as I can sit with the stories that I've written for Archie, while I'm doing other things, I'll hmm. be thinking about what I want to happen in the story, and I'll build up the general outline, and then I'll come up with little snippets of dialogue. And, you know, once I actually get down to sitting down to write it, I'll have all my notes there in front of me and I'll just start typing away. And, uh, you know, the first issue, I've only written the first half, the first two issues of the pirate 
pump, uh, pirate plunder panic story. <laughs> the first one was really easy, I thought, you know. And then there was he, uh, Paul, or yeah, Paul Kaminsky had some really good criticisms and, and you know edits for me to do. So I almost I almost rewrote rewrote the whole thing, uh, not structurally, but a lot of the scenes and dialogue and things I changed. Um, which was fine. I think it turned out a lot better, which is, uh, you know, which is why we have editors to help That's us. That's a great thing about editors, you know? <laughs> yeah. They help us get past ourselves, you know? Yeah. I thought there was some stuff in there that I thought, this is great, you know, it's fantastic. And I don't think it was bad, but I think what, what he asked me to change was much better. So much more accessible to, you know, a wider audience. So, um, um, but the second issue was a lot, it was a little bit harder. It took me a little more time to, to, to flesh out. And I know for a fact that the third issue is going to be even harder because that's the most vague <laughs> of the, of the set in my mind. The last issue will pretty well write itself, I think. But yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Writing is just, it's much different in, to, for me. It's a much different mindset. It's, uh, a lot physically speaking physically speaking it's much easier it takes way way less time than drawing yeah but so. you, you've, always, you've got to think everything through you know all the all all the interactions all the all, all, all the different things that could be going on and how and how certain people would act and yeah exactly it is difficult it is difficult to come up with a story that makes sense you know within a theme and it has to make some logical sense as to why these characters would be doing this stuff it's not it's not easy it's certainly not easy at all but i just mean like from a, the physical standpoint compared to drawing oh yeah, yeah, I, mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean i mean i've been writing this th this thing with uh cory holmes and like for, for me writing is just but for him it's just, when he has to draw draw something it's it's, it can be physically physically taxing for him. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> and it's cool too because writing is like you can you know you get to come up with these ideas and it's you all can come up with these gigantic know. massive things and then the artist has to figure out how to draw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's true. And uh, you know if something doesn't work with you in your writing, it's not it's not such a big deal to wipe it out and think of something else. But yeah, again, yeah. if you draw First, once you sit down drawing, you can't just change it quite so easily. Yeah. I know on my own works. So I wish I had an editor <laughs> to help me with. <laughs> yeah, Jason, you can't have a full panel on a single page. <laughs> well, you know, you, there's always friends to look things over yeah. too. So. Yeah, that's what, that, 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 that's why I started doing for him. But I'm 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 sorry I didn't do that for the the massive sign of gags thing he sent you. <laughs> it was fine, um, and I yeah I remember that, and I, I in general as I as I recall. You know, it is a good rule when you're writing comics to uh, limit your panels to four or five, maybe six at the most on a page, depending, of course, on what's going on. There are some, you know, there's a couple of panels in my the script that I wrote where I have seven or eight, but there will be that will include some very small, you know, visual yes. panel progressions, you know, that don't have dialogue. So, uh, but yeah, when you're working all that dialogue in there, it's not so easy to fit it on a page. Of course, if you're working on a digital webcomic you, you're not limited to size so yeah. it's not such a big deal sure so um sure. these ne these are next four questions are from the penguin god who is okay. one of my personal favorite members on bumble king um how did you come to write uh, babylon rising we've actually kind of already gone over this haven't we uh yeah basically yeah like i said you know there was there was Sonic Universe seemed like it had some free space in there. I wouldn't quite have to step on Ian's toes so much. And I was just kind of rumbling these ideas around in my head. And they started to coalesce. So I asked Paul if I could do it. And as soon as there was a spot open, he let me have a shot at it. So <laughs> I can, uh, you know, I could tell you about some of the, you know, how things changed on that one. Like with the Sonic oh, X story, okay. how things went different, you know. Yeah, yeah you know, because like. like when I started writing, when I started formulating that story, it was like a year before I had actually written it. So I wasn't sure what was going to be happening in the, the main Sonic book. Um, but I did kind of, early on, I, I, I decided that I wanted to have 
the Battlebird Armada, uh, you know, of course, teaming up with the rogues to fly in and blow up New Mobitropolis, or at least the castle in the middle, anyway, because I thought that would be just a really cool visual. <laughs> Since everything's made out of nanites, they could just rebuild it, right? Yeah. You know? So, so uh, you know, I didn't know what was going to be happening. I knew something was going to be going on with Sally. Uh, I wasn't entirely sure that she was going to be roboticized at that point, but I, I, they were talking about that. So, And then also at the time, you know, Bunny... Um, like the issue, sequentially speaking, like the issue right before Babylon Rising, uh, she got turned back to her fully natural state. So I had to deal with that and Sally not being there, and uh, which actually all worked out really well. And August, I didn't know he was going to be king either when I was first uh, coming up with the story. And I also wasn't, I don't remember, but I don't think that Rotor had his nanite suit yet either. So there's all kinds of stuff that happened in between my initial concept and then the actual writing of the story. But it's really funny that how well things, you know, fell together because having Nogus there was was cool. You know, it, it provided a a nice way to keep the the Battle Lord busy and vice versa. You know, the Battle Lord kept Ixus Nogus busy in the story. <laughs> having Sally Sally not there and then having Bunny was uh, just turned back to normal so we weren't entirely sure of her physical state so I had Antoine being protective of her and carrying her out of town um, so that took you know those at least three of the characters out of the equation so I didn't have so many people to deal with um, the whole thing with uh, Jeffrey St. John, I, you know, I, that was a one panel. I just, you know, a couple lines of dialogue explaining that, you know, he was, he'd like to use his magic to help, but the, uh, uh, Elias said, no, I'm not dealing with you right now. Get out of my face. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's always quick and easy ways to, to, you know, get rid of somebody if you really need to, just to acknowledge they're there and then push them out of the way. Well, Jeffrey did just play keep away with the, Elias's qu- crown, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and. Um, Feel all irate. What, what else was there? The, the, the other aspect of the whole story, which you know, ended up working out pretty well, too, was uh, Ian was, had, when I had just started thinking of this idea, was when Ian was writing the whole story plot of. Uh, Nicole being mistrusted and feared by the citizens of New Metropolis. And in my initial idea, what I wanted to have happen was Nicole just go ballistic and turn everything into the city into some kind of a gun or weapon to fire at the the Battlebird Armada. Have a much larger aerial, you know, bombardment going on. But Ian had written, was, was writing her as you know kind of folding in on herself emotionally and that turned out for the better because there just wasn't enough page space to visually describe all that stuff happening you know showing the buildings changing showing this huge aerial battle i'm currently picturing a gigantic massive cannon taking up a two-page spread (laughs) yeah that's what that's the sort of thing that i really wanted to have happen it just just wouldn't work. There just wasn't enough room, even 22 pages, that it just wasn't possible. Uh, so I, it worked out well that Ian had written her doing that. So what I did was I just had her say, I can't deal with this, and she, you know, shut herself off, basically. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, took all those characters out of the, out of the equation. Made it a much uh, smaller roster to deal with, much tighter story. So and I still got to blow up the castle in the end. And of course, I had the uh, MacGuffin of that gravity ring, but that was, you know, I took that out of the uh, the second Sonic Riders game, and it kind of altered, you know, its <laughs> function or purpose or whatever. But still, I think stayed true to what it was supposed to be. And speaking of the second Sonic Riders game, what made you decide to uh, um, uh, adapt the whole plot point of the Bergs being? Uh... Space uh, being an alien. <laughs> well, it was already in the game canon. I 
I'm of the opinion I like to try to work in as much of the game story into the comics as possible. I guess you don't have to, but I think it makes for a more cohesive world, you know? Yeah. True. Definitely uh, helps with any potential uh, adaptions, anyway. Yeah, so, you know, I just really liked... I basically want to do a story with the Babylon Rogues, because I think they are cool. <laughs> they look cool. They they got those cool hoverboards. They're just fun characters. Whether you really like them or not, you know, I, I still... I just think they're, you know, a fun addition to the Sonic universe. So I wanted to use them in some way, and, you know, rather than come up with some completely new idea, I thought I would adapt, you know, the the existing story. <laughs> Plus having the Babylon Garden be hidden somewhere, I thought, well, I wouldn't, you know... Hidden under Metropolis. Hit, yes, <laughs> hidden underneath the city would give them a concrete reason to go in there and blast it to pieces so they could get down there and get the thing. <laughs> so those are the... Th- uh, yeah, that's all the stuff that <laughs> almost unconsciously, uh, you know, was piecing itself together in my mind, you know. Is there anything in hindsight that you might have, that, that you that you would have liked to have changed? Uh, well, not not necessarily changed exactly. I just wish that I'd had more room, more pages to do the thing. It's like the ending of the story, while I think is sufficient, is fine. I think it turned out okay. I really would have liked to have at least like, you know, two or ideally like four more pages. I could have really packed in a little chase race sequence with sonic and jet <laughs> racing around the uh, perimeter I don't think the have had that yet yeah i wanted them to be racing around inside the perimeter of the babylon garden with a bunch of mechanical um booby traps and stuff and sonic having to actually kind of think for you know stop and think <laughs> how am i going to beat these guys you know my my idea was that he would just stop in his tracks well let me let me go back to say that the uh that robot at the end of that was initially going to steal a cube and, you know, initiate security measures and then go racing around, you know, away from them inside the garden, right, with the cube. So they were all going to try to chase that thing and get the cube back. But then Sonic uses his head. He was going to think, he's going to say to himself, you know, Sally already sacrificed herself because I wasn't thinking. So I need to think. So he just stops mm-hmm. in his tracks and lets the robot and them come around the perimeter of the, the garden back to where he is instead of chasing him. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> then he would have jumped and you know smashed the thing, grab it. And that was basically the yeah, that was that was the only thing I really wanted to add in there and couldn't couldn't <laughs> fit. There's no way. So yeah, yeah, other than that, I, other than that, I was pretty pleased with the way it turned out overall. So um. Have, uh, so uh, on to the next question. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, have you ever actually gotten to meet Scott Shaw? Or uh, yeah, Scott <laughs> Shaw? No, no, no. I've never met Scott Shaw, but I do have the comic that was it you, right? You sent it to me. Yeah, yeah. I, ge- yes. I gave it to you at Summer of Sonic, I believe. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I still have that. It's up in my office here. So <laughs> I appreciate that very much. No, I've never met him in person, though. I'd like to someday. Well, next time you, you you manage to make it down to San Diego. Yeah, I have never have, and I don't know if I ever will. It's oh, quite, oh, right. Quite, quite a ways to go, so maybe someday. <laughs> so, um, uh, has any more recent art in, influenced you? Perhaps any, any current artists that you would say deserve exposure? Um, no, I don't know. I don't read a lot of comic books and stuff. Um. The only artist that's really particularly influenced me recently, I guess, would also, also be Ben Bates. Because when he came on the book, I really, really enjoyed his the dynamic flow of his action. You know, how, you know, uh, his characters had a lot of, you know, really great animated looking movement to it. So, you know, I kind of mimicked his, I tried to mimic his style a little bit when I did issues 235 and 236 of Sonic the Hedgehog. Because he was doing the other issues at the time, so... I thought it'd be fun to try to, you know, keep the the style looking the same and kind of emulate what he was doing a little bit because I really enjoyed it. So I hope that he, you know, continues to work on the book and continues to get other work and has a, you know, oh, successful yeah, he's, career. He's superb. <laughs> Alongside you, he's he's among um, my my favorite artists on the book. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I I I, Though I can't I, say I think... enough good about him. He's, he's really good. <laughs> 
I keep getting you guys mixed up, actually. When I'm looking at a story of things. <laughs> this is Tracy Arley and it's Ben Bakes. And, oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, I'll take that as a compliment. Oh, you, you should. Because uh, we'll talk about this later. Um, a, a, a while back, you and others pitched, a, pitched Nintendo some comic ideas. Any in particular you would have especially loved to work on? Um, I don't know if I, any of them I'd say I would have loved to work on. Yeah, uh, yeah without going too specific about it, Archie was attempting to you know do other licensed material. They approached Nintendo, I think, and uh, eventually that's where we you know we ended up with the Mega Man comic when Nintendo <laughs> didn't want to play ball, but. Uh, oh, Nintendo. They we tried out with Mario, Kirby, and Metroid. And of those three, I think Metroid would have been, you know, the most fun, the most interesting to work on. Oh, God, yes, Metroid's their best franchise, in my opinion. <laughs> that 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 would be so great for any kind of visual media. Exactly. Yeah. It would. Yeah. There's, a, there's, I think, a whole lot that you could do with it. I'm, I'm sure Ian would come, you know, come up with some fun stuff for Kirby and Mario. But I oh yeah, personally, <laughs> just don't know what you would really even do with those properties. You know? We we actually talked to him about Mario recently, he, and he said he had some ideas. Oh, I don't doubt that he does. Yeah, <laughs> He's, uh... it's a shame you guys couldn't get Mario because could you imagine this a uh, Sonic Mario and Mega Man crossover? <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> that would be really neat. <laughs> okay, um, this next one is from Hacking Angel. Uh, who? What is your wait? Oh, great. This is one of the ones I was supposed to remove because it repeats a question, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, um, do you have any artistic inspirations? Well, you just kind of mentioned them. <laughs> yeah, Ben Bates. Yeah, well, I mean, in general, I do have, you know, um, some of my older inspirations are, of course, you know, Scott Shaw. I really enjoyed his work a lot. And um, uh, Bill Watterson from Calvin and Hobbes. I used to very much enjoy his work on that strip, and I a lot of his the way that he drew trees and rocks and you know nature scenes, I I kind of incorporated some of that sensibility into huh. the way that I do trees and things. Um, you know, back in high school and college, I was I liked manga and anime. You know, I still do. I still I like the visual aspects of it, I, the stories I could take or leave. <laughs> but uh, there's I think there's a, there's you know at least a little bit of a hint of anime you know oh, yeah. style in my work uh, uh, that's something i've i've always thought Doc, you had, especially especially with your humans yeah I, I, yeah my humans definitely are my not my best point of drawing i've never been fantastic at human anatomy and uh, yeah. because i'm a cartoonist i've never really put in the time to learn it as i should i did those books um Riding shotgun for Tokyo Pop, and I think you know, I think they're pretty passable. Not exactly the most fantastic work, but that style, you know, is yeah, the sort of pseudo manga anime style. I think that I lends myself. I think, but yeah, I think I think I can do I can pull that off pretty well. As far yeah. as humans, like in the Sonic book, I know that most people think my Sonic humans are terrible, and maybe they are. I don't know. I I should probably. Maybe push it, you know, a lot more cartoony, more American cartoony. Okay. Kind of like, uh, kind of not to interrupt. No, yeah, sorry. Uh, kind of like, the, kind of like the humans that they they did in the Sonic Chronicles game. Those are some really cartoony humans. And also, I think what was it in uh, Sonic Unleashed? Unleashed. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty cartoony in that too. So, I don't <laughs> think that I don't think that would be, you know inappropriate for the, the current Sonic universe that we have going on Archie. I, th I think they'd actually pr probably work a bit better than... than yeah, than, uh, yeah, exactly. They probably would, so... Design. Uh, Alex, I'd skip the next question because that's also a repeat. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for letting me know. Sorry, Black Hawk Omega. Um, squeaky... Uh, so, uh, Squeaky Boogs 13... Uh, he has a uh, he or she has six questions for us. Um, have you been a Sonic Have you been a Sonic fan prior to working on the comic, or did things just end up that way? Now I know like you you've seen the Sonic comics, but before but before now, but just tell us about how uh, what you 
thought of si- – god damn it. Can you start over? Right. Hold oh. on. Let me, let me time that so I can edit that out. <laughs> All right. I was a little unprepared for that. Okay, go ahead. So, um, Okay, so uh, the, these next six questions are from Squeaky Boots 13 um, so, uh, c- could you tell us about, um, your, uh, your Sonic fandom prior to, uh, your work on the comics? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I've always been a Sonic fan since the first video game in 91. You know, I really just fell in love with them. I played them all the time. And, of course, I, I saw the first, um, miniseries that Archie had put out for Sonic the Hedgehog, the comics, with Scott Shaw. I really thoroughly enjoyed his cartooning style. And then uh, once after he was, was I was Dave Manick, I think. I oh, yeah, was took Dave. over Took over after him. Not that there's anything wrong with Dave Manick's art whatsoever. It just didn't appeal to me nearly as much. So I kind of dropped it after that. And, you know, I'd see it on the stands over the years, you know. Um, and basically after I got out of college, I was kind of surprised that it was still running. Not that, you know, I had any, you know, not to put any aspersions on its quality or whatever. I just well, was surprised well, I mean, that... It's just that video game kind of experiment. Yeah, exactly. Who, who who would have guessed that it would run so long? So, uh, you know, I think when I was out of college, I uh, I sent a submission packet with some, you know, just some pages that I had drawn of Sonic. Uh, basically just some action sequences, you know. Uh, I think... I think Gabri was the, the editor's name at the time. J.F. Gabri, I believe. And uh, I never, of course, heard anything back. You know, so I didn't really think much of it until a few years <laughs> later. You know, and uh, when things lined up and I got the job, and I was really very pleased about it, of course. <laughs> so, um, do you follow any other comic series? And if so, which ones? No, I really don't read any comics regularly. I wouldn't mind, you know. Uh, I've never been into comics all that much in general. I mean, I enjoy the art, and I've always liked drawing them, but I've never, never really read them. So, um, yeah, I tried when I was in like high school and stuff to maybe try to get into X Men or something like that, but there's just so much backstory and stuff that I had no <laughs> idea what's going on. So, um, no, I don't, I don't read anything regularly right now. I, I generally try to keep up on what's going on with like you know sonic and mega man and uh i think the new crusaders the stuff that archie sends to me every month so (laughs) oh they actually send you complete comics i yes they send me uh complimentary copies of pretty much everything they publish every month yeah not always like the hardcovers and graphic novels but they're you know they're uh you know the standalone issues i get i get those every month so (laughs) So, um, um, what was your favorite issue to draw? Probably, mostly for nostalgia's sake, uh, but it was probably the Order from Chaos two-part story back in issue 168 and 169. I think that I had kind of, you know, hit my stride with just the issue right before that, uh, and, you know, I had taken some very good advice from Jim Amish on using a lot more black, uh, spot blacks and stuff. I thought it really turned out a lot better than what I had been doing. And Ian's story was really a lot of fun. You know, we had Super Sonic. We had the Chaos Emeralds and Super <laughs> Shadow, Super Tails. We had uh, – I got, I got to design that cool Tommy Turtle robot, which that – again, that was one of the instances where Ian kind of had some ideas – but then I took them and fleshed them out and, you know, put my own spin on them. And, yeah, so there's just a lot of really cool stuff in that story. It was a lot of fun and very memorable. So hmm. the only the other most favorite issue to draw was uh, 175 for sure, where Sonic uh, gets beat oh, yeah. by Dr. Eggman. That was a <laughs> lot was of fun. That's such an epic comic. I just love that yeah. little panel. I got your uh, – what is it? I got your limit right here. I love that bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, was, that one was really fun. Visually, that probably remains one of my favorite Sonic comics because it, 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 it just looks so nice, especially the battle between Sonic and Robotnik. It's just 
I mean, I, I, I mean, like technically, you've 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 uh, you've you've improved considerably since then, but there's just there's just something about how, how you how you drew that comic and how uh, the the colorist did the colors. It just makes it look really great still. All these yeah, like, it's yeah, it, it really holds up. I think it's one of the that whole uh, three parter. I think really is pretty good. <laughs> that, was, that was another one where there was like uh, I think it was issue one. 70 yeah 176 there's tons of crowd scenes right to draw like you know 30 40 characters all running together <laughs> <laughs> wasn't that wasn't very easy but so um do you have any characters that you that that you like drawing you know there's just something about about their design that just sort of stands after you yeah well sonic in particular mostly you know the hedgehog characters because they are usually doing the most uh, energetic and dynamic things. Hmm. So, yeah, Sonic is, you know, pretty simple to draw compared to some of the other characters. So, uh, but yeah, he's usually doing, you know, you get to come up with a lot of different poses for him and stuff because he's always running and jumping. And um, yeah, Doctor Eggman is one of the you know, one of my favorites and least favorites at the same time because he's kind of con- a little more complicated than he looks. And his head is kind of weird. No neck. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. But he's also a lot of fun to draw because he's usually, I said, you know, evil smile and stuff like that. So. So um, have you have have you ever had to completely uh, scrap a page and start from scratch? Not that I can really think of. No, there was. I think the only. The only real instance of that was issue 184 uh, or 5 or whatever it was of the uh, the Enerjack Reborn story where it's the last page of the issue and Knuckles is, has taken off his Enerjack helmet and we finally see that it's him. I, just, <laughs> I, re- I recall that I was drawing that. It just didn't look you know, cool enough, so I started from scratch on that. That's extremely rare that that ever happens usually i'll just erase and redraw okay so um oops where, where, where'd it go so uh I, uh oh yes okay this is this is one that we all have to answer but uh mr early you can go first uh you are forced to spend the rest of your life locked in a room with either bean marine or mammoth mogul which would you choose and why? <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's a, that's a tough choice, but I think I think that I would uh, it'd either be definitely Mammoth Mogul or Marine. I would not pick Bean because he'd just drive me nuts. I think it'd be funny for a little while, but then uh, it'd, be, it'd be too much after a while. And not to mention Marine. She... Huh? Oh, go. Uh, I was gonna say, well, with Marine, yeah, yeah, she's definitely have plenty of conversation. <laughs> But uh, again, the same the same thing. She might drive you nuts after a while. <laughs> if you yeah, if you if you have to be stuck in there and you can't escape, then I'd get, I'd go with Mammoth Mogul because at least uh, you know you'd have some intelligent conversation. Well, uh, Jason, Jason, how I'll about be the same. Uh... <laughs> really? Oh, come on. Yeah, I mean, Ma- Mammoth, you're not gonna go with Marine because she's like nuts, and Bean is even worse. So it have to be with Mammoth. Well, well, I was going to go with Mammoth Mogul, too, but that's only because he's a god and he can just break the door down. <laughs> I mean, he can technically break the door down, too, but he'd also explode everything. So. Yeah, you might... Uh... I have a small room with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this, uh, this next question is from Spin. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Try your hand at writing at writing stories for Mega Man. Probably not. I really don't know much of anything about the Mega Man. You know, I I've never I like the visuals. I really love the artwork and stuff. But I you know I've never been good at the games, and I don't really know what you could do with him aside from yeah you know Mega Man fights the rogue robots of the week. <laughs> I, sh- I you know I really uh, I haven't read I started I read about the first half of Ian's run on Mega Man and then I kind of didn't have the time so I'm not sure what even he's doing with that so I need to go back and see. Hmm. 
So uh, does this mean you don't have a favorite Mega Man character? Uh, yeah, well, if you're just talking from a visual standpoint, I'd definitely go with, um, uh, what is it, Zero from the, the Game Boy Advance Mega Man Zero series. Hmm. I really, really love those character designs in those games a lot. So, well, yeah, he is kind of, uh, kind of Mega Man's uh, shadow. You know, looks all badass and stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, he's got those really cool looking like energy blades and stuff. You know, I really think that was a really neat idea <laughs> that they had there. And I just like how angular, you know, all that artwork is. Really nice. So Sonic. So these uh, these next six questions are from Sonic Blue Ranger. Is uh, uh question one is uh, is Pirate Sonic a real character or just a cover cameo? <laughs> yeah, I hesitate to answer because I don't want to spoil anything. But oh. I will. I will say I, he's not in the comic at all. It was just a okay. fun, cool image. It was just yeah, it was just a cool image for that first cover to grab people's attention, you know, remind this is still Sonic comic, so, but, uh, I, I, cause yeah. I, I was going to say, you know, that, that's not what you said last time. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, he, is, yeah, that, I misspoke. Is, yeah, he's, he's definitely not, yeah, he's definitely not a character in the story. No. Okay. <laughs> that's what you said last time. So, um, uh, number two is a repeat. Uh, so, Oh, thank you. Okay. Five questions. So, um, what, what are some other comics you'd love to draw for? Uh, like I said, not not a whole lot. I mean, I, I think it'd be kind of fun maybe to try my hand at Batman, Spider-Man. I like those characters a lot. But my style doesn't quite mesh with that, you know. Maybe if I worked on one of the animated style books, I think that'd be kind of fun to do. But, uh, yeah, you know, like I said earlier, Darkwing Duck or um, uh, Inspector Gadget would be cool. So... Um. If those books, if they existed. <laughs> Other than that, I'm not sure what else is out there. So uh, it's hard to say what I would like to, you know, maybe maybe a Teen Titans type of book. That'd be that'd be fun. <laughs> that'd be interesting. So, um, what are some other crossovers you'd love to be involved with? Um, I don't know. I I don't know. Depends, I guess. Depends on what the, who was getting crossed over. <laughs> But uh, the Mega Man one was a lot of fun. It was definitely different to draw all of those characters, you know, that I wasn't familiar with. So <laughs> it took me about an issue and a half, two issues to really kind of get a handle on Mega Man really well. <laughs> all right. But, so uh, this next one is from Spin. Um, considering that Ian did a ninja arc with Journey of the East, and your upcoming arc is a pirate plun is pirate plunder. Panic. Who will win in a fight? Ninja Ian or Pirate Tracy? <laughs> that's that's tough to say. Um so I think if there was you know long range weapons, you know, with cannon fire, I'd I'd probably be able to beat the ninjas with my cannon fire. But if they got on board and it came to hand to hand, I think ninjas would probably win over pirates. Yeah, yeah, that, that's generally the the conclusion that people come with. But I think that <laughs> in close combat, you know, pirates are kind of crazy, and they got grenades, and so they just throw grenades, and the ninjas would all blow up. <laughs> well, that could be. I don't know. Yeah, we'd have to wait to see. I guess. I mean, I, mean, I don't know I'll... how crazy you are, but <laughs> oh, I'm I'm certifiably insane. There's no doubt about that. But uh, I'll have to schedule a fight with Ian and let you know. Then okay, um, let's talk about your next sure. big project that I'm really excited for, the Pirate Plunder Panic. Uh, Can you give us any uh, details on it? Mm -hmm. I don't want to say a whole lot. Um, obviously, the first cover is out, you know, for preview, so we know that uh, Blaze and Marine are in the story, as are Bean and Bark, and Amy and Cream. So it is, in fact, it is sort of a pseudo-sequel to Ian's Treasure Team Tango. It takes place in Blaze's dimension. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I don't want to say a whole lot about what happens. So, you know, I don't want to give too much away. But of course, there will be pirates. <laughs> uh, will uh, Captain Whiskers and Johnny be making an appearance? They will show up, yeah. But uh, I, I'll, I'll, I can say that they are not the main protagonist. 
or uh, the main antagonist in the story. Uh, I have to say, I'm happy that, that we're actually going get to get to see more of Blaze's dimension soon. Yeah, I enjoyed the uh, Sonic Rush adventure video game a lot, so I'm, I'm happy to be doing the, a story that takes place in that world. I really, uh, I've always been really, really kind of fascinated with, uh, you know, actual real world historical naval battles and stuff like that. So uh, trying <laughs> to work a little bit of that stuff in there. Again, my, my initial draft of the, the first story had, had too much of that stuff. It was a little too, uh, you know, specific to that kind of uh, jargon and stuff. I, mean, I don't think most people would have enjoyed it as much as I do. So I really <laughs> scaled a lot of that stuff back. So. <laughs> and it's still there's still a little bit of a you know real uh, nautical flavor in there I think, but uh, it's a little more well, I'm a, know, I'm generalized. A big and big uh, big history buff, so that, that that sort of thing appeals to me. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah I love that time period with the you know the the Great Age of Sail, and <laughs> naval combat on the sea. It's just it's unbelievable if you actually sit and think about the men. You know, really were on wooden boats firing cannons at each other, you know, using sail to go across the ocean. Saying <laughs> yard, yardies. <laughs> yeah, it's almost unbelievable to think that human beings did that. <laughs> really? Um, you know, um, Captain Harlock's been really interested in this uh, interview, so I want to add, add some of his questions in there. Um, sure. Let's see. Sure. From what we've seen of uh, Sonic the Comic, what do you think of it? Any impressions uh, you've got from anything you've seen, including like Google images and such? Uh, um, yeah, I've never really read much of it. Um, I did read the uh, the Sonic Adventure adaption they did, which I think was probably one of the last stories they ever published. I think, but I, th- I thought the art was fantastic, uh, that's, phenomenal. That's where it actually, hmm? Hmm? Uh, that's that's where it ended actually. Did it? Okay, yeah, yeah. And I thought the I thought the artwork on that was phenomenal. And I really, because I really like European art. I, I, I like the European style of comics. Uh, a friend of mine in art school, his uh, <clears throat> fiance was from Belgium, and she brought over these really awesome comics from over there. And I just love the art style. And, and uh, I think the Sonic, the comic, has some, you know some of that flavor in there. Of course, it's a much different different tone from the Archie books. You know, it's a lot more. I don't want to say realistic, but you know it's darker and grittier of the ones I've read anyway, and uh, um, you know a lot more kind of sci-fi, like a more of a general sci-fi it's kind of, feeling to it, as opposed to uh, you know kind of a cartoony fantasy. Yeah, like it's kind of a shame. There are quite a few uh, European books I'd like to see you know come out this this air, around here, like asterisks and no books you can't really find. In America, yeah. <laughs> the way you can in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, is other question. Any thoughts on the Sonic mangas, like the Dash and Spin ones, or the 1992 ones, or recent recent game adaption mm-hmm. ones? Yeah. I've never really, I've never really seen them, so I can't give you an opinion on it. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sure they're probably pretty cool, but I've never seen. Okay, them. his last thing says, say I've criticized you with harsh words in the past and likely do so in the future. <laughs> But still wanted to take this chance to say you're one of the best things that's happened to the comic, and I often love your art. I just, I just also often get these little criticisms. Uh, well, I, I, I that's that's cool. I appreciate the honesty, and I appreciate their uh, opinion. Of course, not everybody's gonna like my art, and they're they're perfectly entitled to their opinion, and that's it's not for everybody. You know, I mean, I I do the best that I can, and I I, I try to put my very best effort in every issue uh, that's possible. But you know, I also know that I'm not perfect. I'm not the best yeah. artist there is. Uh, there's, I was talking about comics in general the other day at that convention, and um, you know, I, like so, there's a lot of artists that could probably draw circles around me, whether it be the Sonic characters or the backgrounds or humans or whatever or any of that stuff, but the key to why I have been successful on Sonic is because I'm pretty reliable. I mean, obviously I'm, you know, talented enough to get the job done and oh, make it sure. good and whatnot, but, uh, uh, you well, know, a, 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 a real downfall. Sonic hmm? X at the same time. Sorry, go on. 
No, I was going to say, a real one of the real... Uh, I'm making a, a kind of a generalization here, but I think it's also somewhat true that kind of the mindset of most people that want to do comics is they aren't willing to work super hard at it. Uh, you know, they think that it's something they can just do for fun and, and somehow make a living at it, but it's not. You know, I you kind of have to work just about 24 hours a day, seven days a week to really make it work. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard and it takes a lot of time and um, commitment to, to get these things done week after week, month after month. And I think that's my biggest asset and that's why that I have, you know, so prevalent – on the Archie series because I'm willing to do the work when other people aren't. So <laughs> well, I think I a know. big I mean, compliment to your artwork is that they've kind of made uh, your, your style the standard for some of the other artists. It seems like, um, I know Stephen Butler try, yeah, uh, does yeah, uh, yeah, they, his art now in your style. Similar. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, uh, I try to keep fairly on model. So yes, I think that it was kind of a directive that uh, they try to, you know, stick closer to the way, the way I was drawing. Uh, you know, Butler and Bates and all whenever they were start whenever he was starting up. So, so yes, I, that is a very big compliment to me. I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> I, I do have to uh, c concur with um, with the uh, Harlock though that um, really when when you returned the comics the comic books became so much more visually appealing to me because I. I can be I, I can be pretty picky when it comes to artists, and I was not a big fan of um, some of the other uh, other people that he was employing at the time. And so when mm. you and Ian came on at the same time for the same comic, it was like, wow, I'm gonna have to start reading this comic again because <laughs> it is yeah, this is that was, the, uh, the best Sonic comic I've read in years. <laughs> that was all all engineered by Mike Pellerito. He was uh, <laughs> you know the editor editor at the time, and he. Took a chance on Ian and took a chance on me, and it paid off. So paid I, off. you know, I have <laughs> yeah, infinite, infinite, infinite gratitude to Mike Pellerito for for uh, giving me the chance. And so we wouldn't be where we're all at without him. <laughs> <laughs> next time, next time you write to Sonic Graham, say thanks to Mike. I would honestly say that was like it was him bringing you and Ian on that really kind of reinvigorated the book because ever since then, you know. We've gotten spin-offs, we've gotten magazines, we've been getting all this new stuff. Yeah, Sonic Universe that didn't exist and before. Yeah, yeah. You two guys were brought. <laughs> yeah, Mike and uh, you know, and Paul now as his successor, he's, Paul works really hard to try to, to keep things fresh and new and cool and you know, new you know, exciting advertisements in the book and and uh, you know, get people interested in things and all the new titles that come out, the reprints and stuff. So so, uh, Jason, uh, you, you can ask your Sonic Games um, question? No, I'm not going <laughs> to do that. Oh, come <laughs> on. I only cut out one. You can you can ask the uh, others. Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, uh, I, I, know sure, much, I try to get below six panels on my stuff, but as an amateur writer, it's kind of <laughs> tough for me. Um, so uh, what was it like for you having to draw like a shadow clone and drag? <laughs> Uh, it was fun. I really, I really enjoyed that project. It was a lot of fun. In general speaking, the the Sonic X books were fun to draw because they were more lighthearted and you know, action oriented and kind of goofy. But uh, you know, yeah, your 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 story was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, how, you seem to be the most open artist when it comes to uh, working with the fans. How many pro projects have you worked on? Um, I really. Don't thank any others besides you. I think. Uh, oh, I <laughs> in mean, fact, you're uh, willing like, to pay me to I do mean, it. Like, um, good. <laughs> there have been some like fan characters or or some kind of stuff that you've done for. Oh well, folks. sure, yeah. I mean, on Deviant on Deviant Art, I've I've done. I used to do a lot of commissions. Um, you know, people ask me to draw their characters. I judge. You know, I don't. I'm not out to gouge anybody. But I I can't. I don't have the time. Don't have the time to do these things yeah. for free. So I charge. You know. A little bit of money to draw their characters, and they'll they'll send me the artwork, and I'll I'll do it up in my style, and I send them a scan and mail them the original art. And most people seem to like, you know, they thought it was a lot of fun. I gotta so. thank my buddy Alex here because he's the one who upfronted the money for <laughs> those projects. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, 
Oh, yeah. Okay. And I, I was very happy yeah, with the Christmas well. story. I thought that came out very well. Oh, the Christmas story was awesome. <laughs> oh, it's like, oh, can you, can you do me like a Christmas special and like six, uh, write me a Christmas special in about six pages? I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's going to be a challenge. <laughs> but I think it came out all right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that, that's the one I, I remember more because it had the color and all that was, yeah. So um, are, are those all the uh, Sonic yeah, yeah. Eggs questions? All right, then. I, I, guess, I guess, aside from one last thing, we're done. So um, now uh, there, is one, there is one more thing. Now, this should, now by the time this, this podcast goes up, this, this should already pretty be well known because at the time of this recording, I'm about to put up, put up the contest. But, yes, uh, Tracy Arley will be doing – I will be paying Tracy Arley to do uh, a commission – for the grand prize winner of the Sega Bix Summer of Art Contest. And so if, if you guys haven't seen it yet, I encourage you guys to go over to Sega Bix and take a look and maybe think about submitting something. And he will draw a, a single Sonic character of your choosing. You know, just, just, just keep it clean and stuff. And it's... <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing, yeah. nothing, nothing embarrassing or whatever. So... Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah that's uh, 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 say I also have to apologize for what? folks on the Bumble King forums. I I opened it up the questions again, but unfortunately we just don't have time for all those. But there wasn't wasn't too many uh more added. Yeah. So so well, you uh, know, like I said, some other time I'd be happy to come back again. All right, I, we really appreciate it. Yeah, and um th- and th- thanks for uh, uh uh, agreeing to uh, uh, do something for the uh, Sega Big Summer of Summer of Art Grand Prize. Uh, no problem, man. it's my pleasure. <laughs> uh, yeah, really. I I wish that I had time to do uh, you know all the requests. I get tons of requests for art all the time, but uh, you know, work's got to come first. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I know I know that people like to read the comics, so <laughs> I like to try to to get those worked out once in a while. Alrighty, that's the bill. Well, I guess that means it's time to go. <laughs> oh, I guess so. Whatever that is. What? That was uh, that, that was my that, that was my dad's bird. I'm visiting my parents. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, well, gentlemen, I I guess I'll say goodbye here. I, I was yeah, really it was really a pleasure. It was great seeing. It was great hearing yeah, from you, Tracy. Yeah, very much a pleasure. Indeed. Thanks for having me. And uh, nice hopefully this interview, I think I think this interview went a lot better than the last one, and I, so long as the oh, audio yeah, works I can out. Yeah, hear everyone real clearly. You know? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, it was nice talking to you. Man. All right, All right you too, guys. You. Take it easy. Bye. Bye.